Lord, we thank you for the goodness of your hand and for the blessing you pour upon your people every day. Thank you, Lord, because of your favor and your mercy and your love and compassion. Thank you for the salvation of our souls. Thank you for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Lord, we pray that nothing on earth and nothing from the pit of hell will take this salvation from your people in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, every day to appreciate every good thing that you have done for us. And then, as a result of that, we lay our lives down to serve you acceptably, Lord. Thank you, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We're looking in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because the widows were neglected in the daily ministration. As we look at that verse, you find what happened in the early church. And that thing that happened in the early church could have crippled the church, could have weakened the church, could have destroyed the church, except that a solution was brought immediately. It was a disease, a disease for the body, for the body of Christ, just like a disease or sickness in your own body that threatens your health threatens your happiness and threatens your progress and threatens every good thing the Lord wants to do in your life. There are diseases which threaten the life of the human body and you need to know as well there are diseases that threaten the life of Christ's body, the church. And such diseases kill people prematurely. We're told that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verses 10 and 11, a kind of disease that came to the body, to the assembly, to the congregation at the time of Moses. And that disease became a kind of terminal disease that destroyed almost the whole congregation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 10, now all these happened unto them in verse 11. For examples, and they are reaching for admonition and learning, our instruction, upon whom the ends of the world are come. What were the things that happened? The Paul, the apostle was referring to, and he's saying, Corinthian church, you're like a body, the body of Christ. And if you allow this terminal disease to take root in your life, it will literally destroy and kill all the cells of the body. Look at verse 10. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. That was the disease, murmuring, that came in their midst. And it happened to become a life-threatening disease, in that assembly, we're looking at First Corinthians chapter 11, looking at verse 30. And you'll see that those people that are supposed to be worshipping the Lord and rejoicing the gifts of the Spirit, allowed some things to come into that body. And that eventually destroyed many of them. First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 30, for this cause, for this reason, just because of this, not because it was the will of God, not because it was the plan of God, not because this was God, what God intended originally, but because of the disease that came in, into the body. It says, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many die, many sleep. As we think about uh, the early church, and you think about that church in Acts of the Apostles that were filled with the Holy Ghost, and those people at the Word of God being preached to them without fear, without favor. You have the grace of God flowing into their lives. You have the power of the Holy Ghost manifested in an unprecedented manner. And yet something came in 
Another thing that came in, the apostles recognized immediately this was going to be a life threatening disease. I'm coming back to Acts of the Apostles again, chapter 6. Before chapter 6, you know what had happened? The church was united together. The members and the ministers, the members and the leaders, the leaders and their followers, in one accord together. And great was the manifestation of the power of God. Persecution came from outside, but that persecution from outside couldn't have any effect on them. In fact, it became even stronger and became more bold as a result of the pressure coming from the outside. Now this came from the inside. And it says, in those days, in those days of rejoicing in the Lord, in those days of revival, in those days of spiritual life coming through everybody, in those days of the manifestation of power, like in the days of Jesus Christ all over again in the church, in those days, in those days when Gamaliel rose up, and he said, you people, these people of the Sanhedrin, what, what you do? Because if this be of God, nothing will be able to destroy this. But if it be of man, it will fizzle out by itself or kill itself, destroy itself. But if it be of God, be what for what you do. Let's be found fighting against God in those days of spiritual protection upon the people. When the number of disciples was multiplied and God was just blessing the evangelism and their outreach and their discipleship making and God bless everything that they did in the church and disciples who have been born again people have been born again and developed in the Lord and they multiplied it says they arose a murmuring of the gracious against the Hebrews because of the widows were neglected in the daily ministration about food about material things, about non-essentials, about passing things, material things that didn't matter at all. You're going to find out that is this little, little things, inconsequential things, insignificant things, people are allowed to destroy their lives, to kill them, to scatter them. And to stop the great work of God that is doing among the people. You find the same thing with the children of Israel. They are loud, just murmuring over food. They forgot the Red Sea that was divided. They forgot all those great miracles God did for them in the land of Egypt. And they forgot everything that Moses made to them. The little thing, what are we going to drink? And what are we going to eat? And our soul is not fed up with this manner. Those non-essential shells capture their interest almost kill them almost destroy them in fact it was because of those little little things many of them did not get to the land of Canaan the land of promise not because they broke the Ten Commandments, actually the Ten Commandments were intact. But some of them, many of them that more much in the wilderness, it was because of the things that mattered not. The things we take in today and then we pass out tomorrow. The things of passing value, of low value, those were the things that hindered them from having the promise of the Lord they have given to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. That's why we need to look at this. I'm talking to you today on the healing of a life-threatening disease. The healing of a life-threatening disease. The disease of murmuring. The disease of allowing those passing things, non-essentials, unimportant things, inconsequential things to so take root in your life. And then you allow murmuring and grumbling and discord and complaining and then your life is gone just because of the three points in the message. Number one, highlighting the deadly disease of murmuring. Highlight it. Begin it to view that you'll see yourself. What the Lord says about it. What he did to people before us. What he can do to us who don't take care of it. Number two, healing the deadly disease of murmuring. Once you find it in your heart, in your life. Also find it, destroy your family and destroy your local assembly. Getting rid of it immediately. Healing the deadly disease of murmuring. Number three, holiness of disciples delivered from murmuring. 
the disciples were delivered from murmuring the holiness, the kind of lifestyle, their character, their conduct, the kind of life they lived because of that deliverance from that disease of murmuring. Number one, what's number one? Highlighting the deadly disease of murmuring. Exodus chapter 16. In Exodus chapter 16, I'm reading from verses 2 and 3. Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 and 3. It says, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Can you imagine these people? It appears you think they have never got any blessings from the Lord, their redemption, they forgot, their salvation, they forgot, the joy in the Lord, they forgot, the singing, the, they just finished singing in chapter 15. How glorious the Lord is. How wonderful the Lord is. And then he said, Our God is holy. Our God is mighty. Our God is powerful. He made the horses and the riders to be drowned in the sea. He glorified the Lord just because of food. Because of their tummy. Because of their belly. Now they forgot everything. And it says they murmured. By the way, this was the first instance of murmuring. And why murmur? When you can ask, eventually they asked, eventually they prayed, eventually Moses prayed. Why make prayer the last thing? Why don't you make that the first? Why make the request before the people of God the last thing? Why make why don't you make that the first? Why are we so slow in understanding that everything that happens we must first murmur and then when we get into trouble by murmuring is then we remember, oh, we can pray, oh, we can ask, oh, we can discuss, oh, we can share our minds together, oh, we can reveal our request to the leadership. But it is the last. Look at verse 7. And in the morning ye shall, ye shall see the glory of the Lord. For that ye hear, for that ye hear it, your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings which ye murmur against him. He said, It's against him your murmuring, for what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Murmuring overlooked the danger ahead. They were thinking ahead of them. They were in the wilderness. The serpents in the wilderness, they forgot. The drought in the wilderness, they forgot. If God should abandon them in the wilderness, they forgot all about that. And because of the little problem of the present time, they forgot all the danger ahead of them. They forgot they needed God much more than when they were in Egypt. And now because of that forgetfulness, they murmured against the Lord. Look at Exodus chapter 17, verse 2. Wherefore the people did charge with Moses. They quarreled with Moses. They strove with Moses. And said, give us water that we may drink. Hey, my friend. There's another way you could say that. You could go and say, please, leader Moses, we're thirsty. Can we have some water to drink? What are you going to do? We we'll praise God for all the miracles God has performed through you. How those magicians were silenced. And how Pharaoh was drowned in the Red Sea. And we thank the Lord for the mighty things he has done for us. But now we have a need. We, have some, we need some water to drink. There's another way you could say that. That's how you can make your request before the Lord and before the leadership. But no, they said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, why chide ye with me? Why strive? Why quarrel? Why fight? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the, and the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, Don't we have another method to be able to satisfy our need? Isn't there another approach that these children of Israel could have taken? 
and the water will still be supplied? Is there not a better way? Why are we so kind of straight jacketed that it's always like this? We must make a request known. There's a more pleasant way. There's a better way. There's, there, there's a way the children of God who are saved and those who have the grace of God in their lives. There's a gracious way. They make their request known. And so Moses said, Why do you fight with me or chide against me? Wherefore is this that thou hast brought? Why for you brought us out of Egypt to kill us? And our children and our cattle were thirst. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, what shall I do unto these people? They be almost ready to what? Tell me out loud. Stone me. I told you a parable, a fable. The scorpion said to the frog. You remember that fable? Can you please get me to the other side of the lake, of the other side of the river? And the frog said, oh, can I take you to the other side? Because scorpions sting frogs. If I carry you on my back, try to help you. I'm trying to get you to the other side of the river. When we get to the middle, you stink me and I will die. Oh, and the scorpion said, Hey, Mr. Frog, listen to this. I can't do that. Because if I do that, and you drown, I drown myself because I cannot swim. Therefore, if I hurt you, I hurt myself. Oh, the frog said, Mr. Scorpion, Looks like you are reasonable today. Jump on my back. And he jumped on his back. When he got to the middle of the river, man, the scorpion stung him. See, Mr. Scorpion, see what you have done. Why have you done this? He said, I'm sorry. That's my nature. Your nature is killing you. Look at here, Moses. Here is Moses. All these Israelites, they don't know how to perform miracle. What did they know how to bring water out of the rock? What do they know? How to cross the wilderness and get to the land of Canaan. And Moses said, they'd be almost ready to stone me. If you stone the man, you perish in the wilderness, you hurt yourself. We come back again to that fable of the frog and the scorpion. Scorpion, whatever you do to that frog, you do it against yourself. You'll drown because you cannot swim. And so, these Israelites didn't understand. They felt they were just grumbling and murmuring against Moses. Well, when does a man do much? When does he manifest the gift of the Spirit? When does he pray for the sick to get well? When does he open himself to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and direct the congregation? When the man is happy. Well, there's no care here, there's no care there, there's no concern there. The man is free when there's love. When he feels that the people, they love him, they're not stoning him, they're not killing him. He's so happy, he's able to pray with faith, and able to pray with enthusiasm, able to pray with excitement. And then the person that will pray for there with excitement, with faith, with happiness, with joy, the joy of the Lord is your strength, they wanted to stone him. And the man is having a personal problem, the people hate me, and what am I going to do? While he's thinking about personal problem, I see going to pray with faith. For even the water they were asking for, for that to be supplied. They didn't understand, they were killing themselves. That's why Moses cried unto the Lord. Instead of praying for the people, he was praying for himself. He said, Lord, do something now because I'm, I'm afraid for my life. Because they'll be almost ready to stone me. Make your leaders happy. So that they are not just praying for themselves and pray, oh God, save me from persecution, save me from hatred, protect me from this, protect me from that. Release your leaders. When we murmur against them, we fight against them, chide against them, striving against them, they will be busy praying for themselves, personal protection and personal happiness and personal joy, personal this, oh Lord, take care of me, it looks like this and that. Release your leaders to just pray for you. By the way, do you know that in this same chapter, look at verse 8, verse 8, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rufidim. The Amalek, Amalekites were right at the corner, about to destroy them, about to kill them. And here they were chiding and striving and fighting about water. 